Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jao. I'm a DJ and independent researcher, uh, kind of a Marxist musicologist. Um, I would tonight I will uh, present two parts to my presentation. First part will examine sort of a broad bird's eye view of the relationship of social dance, social dancing cultures, social dancing music to civilization itself, to hierarchical forms of uh, governance. And then uh, the second part will be more about the shaping of modern music itself, which is synonymous basically with African American music through the process of uh, 500 years of process of material historical conditions of colonialism and slavery. And I will expound on many of the themes touched upon for the wonderful, uh, from the wonderful panel that came before. So thanks to Hakavi, everyone involved, and uh, the other speakers. I think this is go um, going to be rewarding for all of us. So 2014. Kreuzberg, Berlin. Uh, ten blocks of the city was cordoned off uh, because uh, some refugees had barricaded themselves inside a school. Uh, so I'm sure some of you Berliners remember this. And there was a big protest scene happening outside. A sound system was set up, and there was uh, artists performing. The uh, artist before me was an electro-punk group, very angry music, like Atari Teenage Riot type stuff. Um, very angry, very loud, noise, electro. And uh, the dozen or more police vans around the circle uh, with many, many cops standing around with their arms folded uh, were just watching and people were listening. And uh, when they finished, I came on and I began to play sensuous, groovy African music. And smiles immediately uh, appeared on all the faces around and people got up and began to dance. And it wasn't, an, uh, it didn't even finish the second track in my set before a group of police rushed the stage uh, in a very aggressive manner, screaming to shut down the music. They rushed the stage in a, such an aggressive way, I literally put my arms around my computer to protect it, and I packed up and got the hell out of there. So this experience left me with a question. I mean, it was clear that uh, what was a th threat to the authorities, to the police, was not the angry punk, electro-punk that came before, but it was actually people dancing. And so, why? This re reminds me of a series of anti-rave legislations during the recent decades all over the world, but mainly in the UK, the US, and other parts of Europe. Um, based on allegations of criminal activities during the events, usually involving drugs. Under these new laws, voluntary dance gatherings outside of the structures of consumerism were strictly forbidden. And policies in the UK now had the power to remove people from events featuring music characterized by the emission of succession of repetitive beats. And if you remember, a bunch of electronic artists made fun of this with the, their CD releases would say, this CD contains repetitive beats. Uh, so here's a quote from uh, David Hesmanhal from The Cultural Politics of Dance Music, 1997. Rave confirmed the subversive populism of dance. Its dangerous reputation was seeded by a moral panic in the national press about the drugs associated with the scene. Accompanying this panic, though, was especially strong utopian discourse of collectivism and equality within the club culture, which stressed the breaking down of ethnic, class, and gender differences. Dance events had long been viewed as rituals of togetherness and inclusion, but the new dance culture went even further. And the rhetoric, at least, was genuinely democratizing. No performers, no VIPs, we are all special was the one typical slogan from a club flyer. So as a result, dance, dancing together is often today largely only allowed within the confines of commercialized and licensed club spaces, restrained by codes of conduct and limited within the span of a few hours a night. Similarly, in New York City, one of the major metropolitan areas on earth, uh, there was a cabaret license that was effective for 80 years, almost a century, 
in which clubs had to pay uh, a lot, thousands of dollars for a license, which allows people to dance in their, in their venues. I personally have attended concerts where uh, that was shut down after 10 minutes. The band, you know, get off the stage uh, because some people were swaying back and forth to the music. Um, so let's take a step back into history. 187 BCE, before Common Era, 7,000 members of the cult of Dionysus were imprisoned, tortured, and executed in Rome for challenging Roman values with sex, communal sex, psychoactive substances. Uh, scientists were recently able to ascertain that it was not alcohol, that they were imbibing entheogenic substances, and dancing, and music of the drums, basically illegal parties. The Bacchic mysteries were infamous for the blurring of boundaries between genders and classes and ethnicities, promoting dangerous ideas such as rights for females, for children, and foreigners, and giving slaves a taste of what freedom feels like. Justification for the crackdown was the claim of criminal activities during the all night, all day, sometimes many days, ecstatic orgiastic rites. But even such large-scale suppression failed to eradicate the movement, and Rome eventually gave the cult official status, making it an official state-sanctioned uh, church of Dionysus. In order to curtail its vitality, better monitor the activities of the members, and reduce its influence on the population. So this is exactly the same as what is happening today. Uh, the way that dance cultures are today co-opted by the establishment, uh, by the consumerist order, only allowed to exist in its terms, on its terms, in its authorized spaces, and between restricted hours. People are permitted to have a little bit of controlled, subdued, and commodified fun, but not too much, because the collective experience of exaltation and joy must not lead dancers to question the validity of the regimented routines of normal life. It must not disrupt, crucially, the work, consume, sleep cycle. You ever wonder why one person calls the cops and an entire club full of people, 200, 300 people, have to go home? Why is this one person's need to sleep more important than 300 people's need to celebrate life. Well, that's the reason. But the Dionysian cult in Roman times and other similar mystery religions of the last few centuries BCE were already part of revival movements. There were already uh, revival movements that sought to bring back indigenous Eurasian and European practices. The pre-Abrahamic animist spiritual systems, ancient methods of worship, uh, and modes of being which by then were near extinction already at the hands of the, a succession of conquering armies, empires, from the Assyrians onwards. After going underground again since the fall of Rome, secret bacchanals went on in the forests of Europe until as late as the 1700s before being eventually completely stamped out by the church and the government and religious institutions, only to re resurface in the West a couple of hundred years later, which is the 1960s in the US. Another surviving example of pre-modern pagan traditions is the May Day Fertility Festival, in which young men and women dance to celebrate the beginning of the summer solstice on the 1st of May, around the Maypole. It's a, this is a practice that was banned by the church for many, many centuries. It is surely no coincidence that 300,000 workers in Chicago chose this day due to its association with folk culture in opposition to authority to go on strike in 1866, protesting long hours and horrible work conditions, organized by socialists and anarchists and the w w worker unions. Zacco and Vanzetti, um, as we know, the famous Italian anarchists that were executed, framed for bombing, uh, for setting off bombs. So this is the modern origin of the 1st of May, uh, being the International Workers' Day, which of course is tomorrow. Back to dancing. Uh, 
in terms of both biology and psychosociality, dancing is, I argue, I claim, the central cultural form of our species. Biologically speaking, bipedalism, in an evolutionary terms, or the ability to walk upright, is only possible with cognitive process called beat induction. Beat induction is the ability for the brain, our brain to anticipate the next beat as part of a syncopated pattern. Rhythm in Africa and elsewhere is built around this basic principle. The placement of some of the beats in the rhythm is off of the grid. A little bit before or after the pattern recognition part of your brain tells us that it should drop. And the resultant tension between what your brain anticipates and what your ears hear is the origin of funk, of swing, of what makes us want to dance to the music, what makes us want to shake our booties. So a typical African pattern is boom, 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 ka, boom, 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 ka, boom, 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 ka. So you see that the patterns are a little bit off kilter and that's what the tension makes us move as opposed to African-American music, which is based on the double, which is boom, ka, boom, ka, everything on the grid. So we'll get to that later. And in terms of psychology and sociology, drumming, singing, and dancing together has been the, central, the centrally important communal activity, along with ritualized orgiastic practices in conjunction with the imbibing of sacred entheogens which builds group cohesion, develops trust, encourages cooperation, and forges strong bonds between members of society. We are the slow and weak apes. Our children need years, 10 years, to become self-reliant, very much unlike other species of mammals. And we survived as a species, Homo sapiens sapiens, by working together, by cooperating, by developing high le levels of trust and cooperation. Participatory, participatory dance is deeply ingrained social trait, an essential organizing principle among common to human communities around the world prior to the advent of class society. Roughly 6,000 to 12,000 years ago, because it brings people together voluntarily and creates ecstatic group consciousness via collective trance states, communal dancing renders divisions, categories, inequalities, and laws arbitrary and meaningless, and is a convivial activity inherently corrosive of the top-down hierarchical authority. So th that's the central heritage uh, of our species, I argue, which is or orgiastic, psychedelic, rhythmic celebrations of life, and uh, which is basically sex, drugs, and rock and roll. The sexuality of our ancestors used to be much more fluid and communal, collective. Uh, it's a great anthropology story of, uh, uh, of an early colonist, um, his, uh, from, from France, I believe. Uh, his best friend was a Native uh, American. And during one of the ceremonies, um, he starts having, making love to his, to his woman. And uh, after he was finished, these other men uh, came in and started making love to his wife. And the French guy says, oh, look at this. What? You don't, they are having sex with, it, with, with your wife. And uh, the Native American says, looks over and says, well, oh. She looks like she's having a good time. What's the problem? And the French guy says, well, okay, uh, what about the children? You don't care that the child is yours. And uh, the native man said to him, you Europeans are very strange. You only love your own children. In our society, we love all the children the same. So the sexuality of our ancestors used to be much more fluid and collective. And um, there are even today, examples of communal sex used to create group cohesion. For instance, Air Force pilots regularly have key swap parties, some of them, many of them, to make sure that in case one day they don't make it back from the battlefield, from duty, that their spouses will be taken care of by the other pilots. <laughs> 
So the modern forms, dancing in a circle, the cipher, it's, it, the circular form is inherently egalitarian. Symbolic sexuality today on the dance floor, people go through the motions of symbolic, you know, I'm not, I don't have to mime it, Alfred. You've been to clubs, you know what it is. Uh, these symbolic sexual uh, gestures in the, in, on the dance floor today are reminiscent of what used to be actual group sex. The origins of the cipher is in the Neolithic dances, the dance circles of egalitarian spiritual systems centered around fertility and female sexuality. Women were the organizers of a society's uh, energy flow. A sensually activated woman is a wealthy natural resource for any community. Pleasure is power. That's from India Ameye, an author. And the next bit is, comes from uh, an, a Spanish author called Casilda Rodriguez. And she says, anthropologists have explained how the practice of livestock domestication were applied to human society. To get an ox from a bull, to make it submissive and ready for exploitation, you castrate it. Diminish its vitali vitality in order to control it. Another example is the bonsai, transforming a large tree into a decorative object. You cut the roots. To establish a society of slaves and accumulation of power, we had to change the human being. Cut the roots. This means blocking their sexuality to diminish, to diminish their vitality and introduce a state of lack and need. And this is primarily achieved by eliminating female primal sexuality, a true castration that is inflicted on hu all human creatures. There is a direct relationship between the deprivation of women's sexuality and the development of a social fabric for relations of power to organize patriarchal society. Reich, the uh, biologist and uh, scientist, explained many years ago that the human development deprived of its sexuality produces a muscular psychosomatic uh, armor uh, which numbs us, which makes us capable of both living in, uh, of both being resigned to our condition and of exercising cruelty. So sexism, misogyny, and the demonization of femininity, the fear and hatred of all things feminine, the policing of female sexuality, the restriction, denigration, objectification, and exploitation of women, all of this, which comprised the entirety of sex-based and gender-based oppression, is rooted in her ability to give birth in relation to patrilineal inheritance and descent. Uh, should I repeat that? It's a long sentence. So I'm saying sexism is based in material uh, process of property accumulation. Uh, patrilineal descent, you have to control who your heir is to pass down your fortunes, your properties to. So that's the beginning of the controlling of women's sexuality. With the advent of propertarian patriarchy, women became property of men. The Bible verse, as you remember, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, but it goes on, oxen, house, etc. A central part of this long historical process of domestication, behavior modification, and social control is through sexual repression and the rise of repressive institutions, which began six to 10,000 years ago, is the suppression of social dancing and its communal egalitarianism and uninhibited erotic expression of the body. The leaders of the Black Panthers, remind you, were hunted down and their movement destroyed by the FBI mainly not for their militant posturing, but because of their grassroots community building with programs like the free breakfast for poor children. That is the real danger to the authorities, people connecting to each other and forming collective, collectives outside of their control. And this has always been true throughout the entire history of our so-called civilization. Europe itself was colonized by other Europeans a long, long time ago, similar to how Africa was colonized by other Africans before the arrival of the Europeans. For instance, the Zulu, uh, a Bantu people uh, from the northern parts of Africa, intensely warlike, intensely hierarchical, uh, 
They devastated the indigenous, peace-loving, egalitarian San people of South Africa. Museum of Archaeal Musicology right now in Berlin, or two hours away from Berlin, right now features ancient drums found in present-day Germany, dating from 3000 BCE, 3000 before Common Era, so 5,000 years ago. There are these drums that look like the djembes from Germany. So we can speculate that in this part of Europe, a long, long time ago, 5,000 years ago, there was also vibrant rhythm cultures. People danced communally, people shook their asses without inhibition. But these cultures were wiped out completely by encroaching civilization and mo later modernization and the near total erasure of European indigenous people and cultures. There are some exceptions like the Sami in, uh, in up north. They, have, uh, they still have uh, some uh, remnants of their shamanic indigenous culture. Excuse me. <clears throat> the cultural establishment in hierarchical states, on the other hand, have always regarded social dancing to belong to the realm of the poor, of the uneducated and brutish. Essentially, an indecent activity fit only for drunken fools. And this is largely true, as the lower classes and marginalized groups have always more extensively engaged in participatory dancing, preserving remnants of age-old ancient practices. It is no accident that the most ardent dancers in Europe, with the most fervent culture of social dancing that survives, is of a, a culture and people that is the most recent victim, the most abused and exploited of all Europeans during the colonial capitalist modernization, which is the Irish. And even in Germany and surrounding parts of Europe today, polka is danced by the poor underclasses only. If you recall the scene from the movie Titanic, when, where Leonardo DiCaprio moves from upper deck where people dressed in suits and uh, very polite society, listening to a group uh, quartet of violinists. And Leonardo DiCaprio's character moves down to the lower decks where the mostly Irish, the poor, uh, the crew that worked on the Titanic boat were having a drunken, super fun dance party. In place of music for voluntary and spontaneous communal participation, the upper class nobility developed cerebral and passive musical frameworks that are divorced from the body. These forms, of cha these forms champion top-down hierarchical roles and structures, enforce a rigid separation between artists and audience, and restrict dance to the narrow sphere of performance and spectacle. The attitudes cultivated by this specialized ar aristocratic culture undoubtedly persist today. In fact, if you look on uh, uh, the Wikipedia entry for dance, the page for dance on Wikipedia, first defines it as a performative art form and only mentioning the participatory social aspect of dancing much later. But this general historical process of, is, of course, not confined to Europe. Without exception, legacies of participatory dancing around the world today, or uh, around the world, has always existed in the cultures of the systematically oppressed, underprivileged, and marginalized since the dawn of so-called civilization. While the official music of kingdoms, of states, and their elites is typified by grandiose, courtly, self-important, reserved, and restrictively cerebral, quote, classical, end quote, forms that dictate docile and passive modes of enjoyment. In China, the hundreds of surviving ethnic minorities have hundreds or thousands, uh, no one really knows, have exquisite and flamboyant customs of social dance music compared to the inert, lethargic, and solemn music of the dominant Han courts. Uh, there, are, there are these giant drums in uh, ethnic minority culture in China. We have these giant drums, music of the drums, very, very rich, uh, but hardly known out, outside of those regions. In India, the smaller tribal and religious groups have much more raw, funky, and danceable tunes than those in the highly refined, specialized, 
and formal Indian classical canon. In Indonesia, the smaller gamelans that play human-scaled music found in the vast periphery of forests and islands promotes more joyful, free, free-form dancing in con- contrast to the large ensemble court gamelans that play stately, majestic, and monumental compositions where dance is basically pure spectacle. But yeah, I would just want to make it clear, I'm not making a value judgment. I'm not making a statement uh, about the quality of these different uh, art forms. O- obviously, human creativity thrives under any context. And I mean, I, I love Chinese classical music, Indian classical music, European classical music. Compared to other places, traditional ways of life survived much better on the African continent. As many cultures were only recently conquered by sovereign powers and thoroughly subjected to the homogenizing and destructive forces of imperialism. Large African states, such as the Malian Empire, the Ghanaian Empire, and others, are also somewhat different uh, from their counterparts in other parts of the world in absorbing the cultures of the groups that they conquered rather than eradicating them wholesale, forbidding their language, etc. This is why the culture of rhythm and dance in Africa survives and thrives to a greater extent than elsewhere. So that's sort of in, that's related to the conversation earlier about blackness and, and, uh, and dance. Ever since the advent of colonialism, rhythmically focused music from Africa has been regarded by the European establishment as primitive and subhuman. Its guttural noises and beats seen as belonging much more to the animal kingdom than polite society. In particular, hip movements, shaking the hips, were and still are, as seen in controversies over twerking today, a a huge taboo among domesticated Western subjects. Unbroken connection with the body and guilt-free expression of sensuous energy was and is considered improper and lewd to people conditioned by millennia of body shame and sexual repression. If you go to a dance club today in Berlin, go to a techno club, people do not shake their hips, especially men. There is no hip movements. So this is a general outline. But before... This is the reason why Africans had to be demonized, one of the reasons. Humiliated, brutalized, subjugated, and, quote, civilized. Because their supreme pride and their supreme supreme wholeness, their lack of shame and inhibition were greatly intimidating to the prohibitive cultures of Europe. So I just want to make sure that this is not any kind of essentialism. um, I'm saying that uh, people's cultures are shaped by material history. Anyone not convinced of this only needs to compare the dance floor uh, of any contemporary club in Africa and those uh, here in in these parts. On any given nights, the difference is immense. In Africa, people uh, come into the club at 7 p.m., 8 p.m., start dancing joyously, immediately. And here, of course, we all know people need to drink and drink until 1, 2, 3 in the morning before they start sort of half dancing without hips. So this is the general outline, uh, a general sketch of the material historical backstory which brings us to the modern era and the beat. It is no accident that the beat has become arguably the most prominent signifier of modern popular music, as well as its central structuring element, more than groove, more than swing. Give me a beat. The beat drops the beat goes on. It is also no accident that the word also means to hit, to strike, to cause injury. I was beaten up. I'm going to beat your ass. Pardon my cultural appropriation of African-American vernacular there, but it's necessary for the paper. Half joking there. Yet another meaning is related to domination and subjugation, to beat a rival in the competition. To be beaten down means to be defeated and battered. To be beat means to be resigned, worn down, used, raw, tired. The beat generation, a subculture in the 1940s and 50s, which took its name from the intense rhythms of bebop, identified with the systematically downtrodden 
disenfranchised, marginalized, and exploited. The violent and coercive social ethos also comes to shape ideas of sexuality. As the word beat is also used in a sexual context, to beat off means to masturbate. And in contemporary African-American vernacular in hip hop, beat that pussy up. Similar to how work also becomes a metaphor, work that body, show me what you're working with, etc. The many related meanings of beat perhaps perfectly encapsulates the material historical processes which shaped modern popular music and the physical and emotional essence of African-American rhythm. It hits you like a hard kick, like a freight train in the gut. In terms of music, the beat as we know it today is a rhythm pattern very different from those found almost anywhere else in the world and in any other previous era. A kick drum on the one and three or all four with a snare drum precisely on the two and on the four. It goes boom, ka, boom, ka. With nearly nothing in between except maybe a hi-hat. So boom, boom, cuts, boom, cuts, boom, ka and no major hits ever landing off the grid. This rhythm is called the double in musical history uh, theory. The beat, as we know it, is a reduced and simplified skeletal drum pattern, lean and mean. The beat took on the character of hard labor in cotton fields and later factories. It is the sound of hammers striking rock, of axes falling on trees, and of whips lashing on backs. Variations of it drive all modern popular American music styles, blues, Motown, soul, funk, rock, disco, house, techno, pop. It might be especially clearly pronounced in the boom bap of hip hop. The quintessential African, Afro-North American beat consists of bare kicks and hard snares, reproducing the historical legacy of barbarous coercion and alienated work. It isn't the hypnotic repetition of a supple, sensuous, and generous communal rhythm, but recalls and reproduces the brutality, the monotony, of, and the isolation of modern life. Breaks, breakbeats are a formal device, or the break in songs, where the song all of a sudden stops, and for some silence, with, a, with one part, uh, one instrument isolated and then continues at, at a few seconds later or some minutes later. It's a formal device which does not exist in the dance music of any other time or place and are specific to the modern era in Afro-America. One way to understand these abrupt stoppages and violent uh, interruptions during the libidinous flow of rhythm is that they mirror, express, or are an extension of the regimentation and the compartmentalization of modern life. In modern music, m many songs are separated into distinct parts, and they suddenly switch. Um, this is kind of, uh, it, can be, it can be thought of as a way to express the way that we have to violently uh, change our flow uh, during the day, going from work to, to home or to tra hitting the traffic or these different institutions that we move through throughout our lives. And this is perhaps maybe even more clearly seen in dance. Uh, dance are friends of mine who are trained in uh, very many traditions around the world uh, have told me that hip hop is one of the most difficult for them to do because it is all about these stoppages. It is all about you know, dance, holding the pose, and, and then continuing. It, 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 it's a disruption of, of the body's libidinous flow. And it is very, very different from the continuous sensuous flow of African dance, which is no stops, continuous. How can the experience of 16 generations of chains, abject poverty, and institu institutionalized oppression, followed by lives spent within and switching between institutions of an alienated consumerist order, not produce music of a particular emotional character. A continuous strand of sadness, of rage, of desperation, and of de despair form a 500-year-long line from the origins of the blues and the plantations to the desolate anguish of Michael Jackson. <laughs> 
the real meaning of It's a Wonderful World by Louis Armstrong, if you listen to it closely, his coarse and positively forlorn voice and the sad reeds in accompaniment is that despite all the pain, despite all the heartbreaks, even with all of this injustice, even with all of this darkness and despair and bleakness, even when it is endless and there's no hope in sight, there is, it is still a wonderful world. It is a joy felt through tears. And it is no accident that the king of pop grew up in Gary, Indiana, arguably the most uh, impoverished city of 1970s USA, devastated by mining industry collapse. Just as it is no accident that Michael Jackson's talent developed through coercion and violence by his exploitative and emotionally and physically abusive father who sought to get rich through his children, reproducing the violent coercion and exploitation of labor that is the legacy of not only African Americans, but in many important ways characterize the experience of modernity for us all. Croydon grime, and, grime producers in, in Croydon, a neighborhood of, uh, of London, talk about the snare which smacks you, which smacks you across the room. This hard, harsh snare drum. The beat uh, has come to embody the culture of violence in which it is made. When we say a track is banging, right? Uh, when we say a track is banging, it means it does not mean a gentle swaying groove. It does not mean a joyous celebra celebration of life through, uh, through music, but the hard cathartic beats which distills the experience of domination, of institutional inhumanity and of harsh material realities. We today are so accustomed to the particular aesthetic and emotional character of this modern music, uh, of African, Afro-North American music, that Western lovers of modern popular music typically considers the gentler, more, uh, more joyous and celebratory music of Latin America and Africa as too soft, as too cheerful and too cheesy and not hard hitting enough, not tough enough, not intense enough. We masochistically require sonic brutality, punishment, torture, Harsh music, which is expressive of the anguish and depression of life within a civilization built on slavery and sustained by ex exploitative work. We often hear that African music lacks emotional depth, right? Emotional depth. But what is emotional depth other than the expression of, of depression and rage? The pervasive dominance of this simplified, rigid, and mechanical monorhythm minimizing polyrhythmic elements in the music to the role of embellishment, sometimes to the point of non-existence, is very different from the focus on complex polyrhythms in previous, uh, in various forms of modern South American, Caribbean, African, etc. music. Cuban song and rumba, Brazilian bossa nova, Haitian guoca and compas, Trinidadian calypso, none of them rely so extensively on the duple, on the boom, ba, boom, ba. Besides subgenres which were directly influenced by U.S. exports, such as ska and reggae, which heavily borrows from rhythm and blues and soul. So if we, and if we zoom out to look at great traditions of music of the entire world, of Africa, of Asia, of the Middle East, with zero ex exceptions, the boom bap, dapo, is never a central element, a prominent uh, element in the major bodies of music produced by these ancient cultures. Almost all of the world's social music previous to the modern era are based on intricately interlocking polyrhythms arranged in hypnotic, complex mathematical patterns. So how and why did the modern North American rhythm, the beat, become so different? The answer is surely very complex and includes elements such as uh, Native American music and European music of the colonists, as well as Western military traditions, uh, the, the marching bands, uh, which comes from the Ottoman Empire, etc. I'm um, not going to go into that. But all, uh, all of which made ex ex extensive use of this reduced monorhythm. But there is another crucially important factor which can account for the difference between modern North American rhythm and the rest of the world and the rest of history. 
a single material historical process which unfolded in the early days of America. In 1739, there was a large-scale slave insurrection in South Carolina, which involved hundreds of slaves from many different plantations. The plantations were many miles apart, very, very many kilometers apart from each other, and slaves, of course, had no way of contacting each other. Or they couldn't send each other texts. And it wasn't until this uprising was brutally crushed by the, by the authorities and poles with the severed heads of slaves posted every mile along long stretches of main roads, which is a practice that recalls Rome. This is exactly what they did uh, after they crushed the slave uprisings, is place the severed heads of slaves on poles uh, along main roads. And it wasn't until after the, the rebellion was crushed that the owners realized that the revolt was, was coordinated with the use of talking drums. The language of talking drums, uh, we spoke about it a little bit earlier, is a sophisticated form of communication. It's, it doesn't merely sound like human speech, but it uh, communicates complex messages. You can actually recite epic poetry with the drums. It's, I mean, think about the creative potentials uh, of of listening, uh, of dancing to a drum beat, but it's telling you a story at the same time. I mean, to me, that is just next level futurism that we cannot even, uh, we cannot even get close to. That's a technology worth uh, investigating, but sadly, almost completely wiped out. Today, there are maybe a few masters, master drummers in Africa that, that truly remember the complex uh, language of the talking drums. So as a result of this, soon after, new laws were passed prohibiting the possession and use of drums by the slaves. And violation was punished by the cutting off, oops, by the cutting off of hands or execution. It is absolutely necessary to the safety of, here's the, the law from 1740. It is absolutely necessary for the safety of the province that all due care be taken to restrain Negroes from using or keeping of the drums, which may call together or give sign or notice to one another of their wicked designs and purposes. That's the slave code of South Carolina, 1740. Starting on the plantations of the Carolinas and Georgia, this band soon spread all nearly everywhere on the, on the entire continent. Without drums, slaves used whatever was around to make beats, uh, household items, uh, forks and spoons, hand clapping, and as we saw in the earlier amazing video of patting juba, using the body as a substitute for drumming. Um, but, uh, and also the feet, stomping the feet, of course, ring shouts, one of the origins of modern tap dancing. Here's a quote from 1942 from a writer. It always rouses my imagination to see the way in which the McIntosh County shouters, shelters tap their heels on the resonant floor to imitate the beat of the drum their forefathers, their forebears were not allowed to have. But the most widely used substitute for the drum, surely due to its ready availability, was the human voice. Field haulers, call and response, work songs, songs in the prisons, and all kinds of vocality were developed where the voice replicated drum patterns and created rhythmic counterpoints with standard singing and chanting as well as extended techniques such as uh, all kinds of effects, interpolated vocality, uh, yeah, all kinds of vocal effects, which were also the roots of scat singing in um, in 20th century jazz music. The musical use of meaningless uh, yeah, vocal utterances, which is scat singing. Fast forward to today. This is perhaps even more clear in rap and hip hop. The voice plays the role of complex polyrhythms, taking on the role of djembes and bongos. In fact, when musicologists mapped out the sonic patterns of rap, it is identical to those of African drumming. It hits all the intervals uh, on the, on the beat, in the beat pattern that used to be hit by the drums. Well, at least the good rappers, or even the mediocre, uh, anyway. So if talking drums are named as such, perhaps rap can be rightfully called drumming talk. Actual sounds in the work in the workday 
such as chopping wood or marching, as well as foot stomping or hand clapping during off hours, provided the basic skeletal time signature over which the polyrhythmic vocal sounds could be improvised, sometimes imitating the rhythms of many drums in one line. These vocal elements filled the incremental temporal spaces between each clap of the hand and fall of the hammer and played an important role in the preservation of African rhythmic heritage. Thus, uh, thus, African rhythm traditions survived through mutation and adaptation and formed the drumless foundation of North American music in a social context of repression and persecution. Quote, the Negroes of that country, the Negroes of that country, a few only, only accepted, are to this day as great strangers to Christianity and as much under the influence of pagan darkness, idolatry, and superstition as they were when they first arrived from Africa. Sundays and holidays are days of idleness, idleness in which they assemble together in alarming crowds and for the purpose of dancing, feasting, and celebration. This is from Alexander Hewitt from 1779. Another quote, Nothing is more barbarous and contrary to Christianity than their idolatrous dances the, in which they usually spend all of Sunday. That's a quote from Reverend Morgan Godwin from 1680. Despite pervasive restriction and prohibition, however, Pieces of African-American music traditions not only survived, but thrived. The descendants of earlier styles later became wildly popular in society at large between, uh, beginning in the 19th century. Ragtime, spirituals, salon music, jubilee, blues, gospel, uh, gospel which has been called percussion music without drums by historians. The appropriation of black slave music by white mainstream society started at around this time as well with a, uh, with a phenomenon that we all know about of painting white people painting their faces black to perform uh, the songs of the slaves. The first ever Euro-American, Euro colonist American artist to tour the world and become internationally famous for playing music evolving evolved largely from the slave culture, and indeed preposterously dubbed the father of North American music, is Stephen Foster, who was credited for O Susanna, a song I'm sure everyone knows, which became one of the most enduring popular North American songs ever. And this, and the mixing of Afro and Euro-American traditions, became the origin of country music. One of the reasons country, uh, quote, one of the reasons country music was created by African Americans as well as European Americans is because blacks and whites in rural communities in the South often worked and played together. And because the drums were taken away, the forms of West African music, which were either purely vocal or featured the voice prominently, traditionally played without drums using s I instruments such as... Uh, like uh, such as many kinds of uh, storytelling song cycles in the griot traditions of Mali uh, took root in a big way and gained wide, widespread popularity in the Deep South. No specific African, Amer African musical form can be identified as a single direct ancestor of the blues, but many of its elements, such as the call and, call and response and the use of blue notes, can be traced back to musical traditions in the mother continent. Uh, Alan Lomax, the uh, anthropologist, uh, maybe the first anthro, uh, anthropologist who dealt with music exclusively. Um, uh, he has this amazing uh, collage of uh, field hollering uh, from the Mississippi Delta region uh, juxtaposed with uh, uh, Malian uh, traditional griot, griot singing, and it is actually identical, quite amazing. Rhythm in broader Americas uh, was developed a little bit differently. Unlike African Americans who largely reinvented their musical heritage through memory and forgetfulness, Africans in Latin America and the Caribbean largely preserved homeland drumming traditions in a, in a, a, a wider capacity, which survive nearly intact today due to several main historical material factors. Drums were also banned in the Caribbean in places like, uh, yeah, in, all over the Caribbean, but much later, only in the 19th century. So the slaves had a stronger connection to African rhythm culture, which was apparent, apparent when they started using frying pans, um, oil drums uh, after, the, after the ban, uh, which also took place, oil, 
was an important national product. Uh, and so there's all these oil drums lying around, which is the birth of steel pan, uh, steel pan music, forming the uh, tradition of, yeah, steel pan drumming music. Similarly, drums were also taken away from slaves in Cuba at a later time, and the roots of Cuban rhythm lies in Afro-Cuban playing African music with household items. The side of a cabinet functioned the role of a present-day tumba, or um, an overturned drawer served as the quinto, the lead drum, and the pair of spoons played the cascara part on whatever was available. And that's from David Penalosa, a musicologist. The handmade percussion instrument, clave, uh, wooden pegs, which are wooden pegs used in shipyards for loading and unloading cargo in Cuba, uh, which are hit together to accompany work songs of the slaves, is ubiquitous to Cuban music and its derivatives from son to mambo to salsa to timba. More importantly, the rhythm pattern, also called clave, is the single key which unlocks the rhythm of modernity. The, the, the clave is the most simple and the most reduced of all the African patterns. It's the most simple and it's the one that has survived, which finds expression in practically all modern music as threes overlaid over a 4-4 beat. Bass lines, kick drums, and keyboard lines all take turns replicating the clave. Even in today's most cheesy stadium trance music, you hear in the synthesizers, no, 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 no. So that's the clave right there. Five minutes. Oh, okay. Wow. Okay, I've cut short. Um, so the clave is found in every techno and house track. Uh, other reasons for the stronger ties with the African culture in the Caribbean uh, include slaves, uh, in including slavery much longer, Brazil until the 1880s, um, uh, and there was a lot, of, a lot more um, back and forth from, uh, from Africa to South America. I'm not going to stip, skip this entire section. Uh, there's a single exception um, to drumlessness in the U.S. Drums were not banned in the New Orleans until 100 years later. The center of, uh, uh, which was also the center of, of, of American slave trade. This and other crucial uh, social conditions were the ingredients of a series of cultural musical explosions that would change the course of modern music. New Orleans, being a port city connected to Cuba, the Caribbean, and the rest of the world, had a vibrant and metropolitan economy based on not plantations, but trade. So black people in New Orleans were not automatically slaves. And this is very important for the development of, of music, of jazz. Um, in, in a city where people and cultures from many parts of Africa also mixed and mingled, uh, New Orleans was run by the French and Spanish, Southern Catholic Europeans who, due to geographic, historical, and religious reasons, had more tolerant and somewhat more lenient attitudes towards race and culture uh, compared to the Northwestern Protestant Europeans who ruled other parts of the country. These factors marked drastic differences from the rest of the country in terms of less regimented class structure, racial tolerance, inclusion, and cultural exchange. Drums were not banned in New Orleans until much later in the 19th century, and unlike in other places, blackness in New Orleans was not automatically equated with slavery. A substantial population of mixed race Creole people owned land and nightclubs before the 1890s when they suddenly lost their privileges and equality they participated in every level of society, uh, education, even politics. And most importantly for us, for our topic, the nightclub scene. For much of the 19th century, this opulent melting pot city was host to a vibrant nightlife. Exotic uh, ev events, tribal dances, pagan festivals, f uh, marches, and all kinds of parties that never seemed to stop. Inconceivable anywhere else at that time, New Orleans brothels or allowed sex across color line all the way until 1918 when the U.S. government forced the mayor of New Orleans to impose uh, the s s segregation laws. But most important for us here, it was possible for African and European musicians to play together on stage in many of the clubs owned by the Creole. And 
quote, untouched by the Industrial Revolution and less socially stressed than other plantation-oriented economies, New Orleans was able to retain the traditions of the various ethnic groups while they were rapidly being annihilated in the rest of the USA. That's from Piero Scarufi, a music historian. And there was one place, the only place in the entire continent, the, the Congo Square, I'm sure I'm going to just briefly touch, but because I'm sure it was uh, talked about in, in detail earlier, um, in the Trime neighborhood, where slaves had for a much longer time, nearly a century, been allowed to make music and dance together. Yeah. Uh, so we know about the Civil War, the large surplus of no longer needed uh, instruments uh, from the armies, bass drums, snare drums, um, which came, went into jazz music. Um, skipping this part. It is probably, here's a quote, it is probably safe to say that by and large the simpler African rhythm patterns survived in jazz because they could be adapted more readily to European rhythmic conceptions. Some survived, others were discarded as the Europeanization pro progressed. It may also account for the fact that patterns such as uh, clave remained one of the most used and common syncopated patterns in jazz. That's from Gunther Schuller. A few decades later, the first recordings of a new hybrid style uh, with much more reduced, simplistic, and obvious drum beats was made in the exact same Trime neighborhood rock and roll. Fats Domino, his first records were made in that same neighborhood. So in a nutshell, argue, arguably two of the two most significant American cultural contributions to the world, jazz and rock and roll, are both born in not only the same state, not only the same city, but the same neighborhood within that city, the same few blocks where for some decades, African Americans were allowed to play drums and dance. Louis Armstrong grew up within blocks of Congo Square. In a sense, the birthplace of modern music itself, from there it developed a long lineage of African American music during the 20th century that shaped modern music as we know it. So the mainstream liberal, the mainstream liberal narrative of progress and of, of development is that of modernity and capitalism enabling a blossoming of creative potentials, enriching our lives with greater variety than ever before, while the truth is the exact opposite, that everything that we love, all of these, this music that we love, has managed to, th to survive and thrive against all odds, against all repeated attempts to destroy it. And so I think the popular notion today that dance music and its, is, and its unreflective hedonism is apathetic and apolitical needs to be turned on its head, needs to be reversed. Social dance itself is inherently anarchic, communist, democratic, and revolutionary. Reconnection to both the flows of our own and other bodies can be insurrectionary and an embrace of communal orgiastic sexuality even if only symbolically, is itself a radical gesture caustic to authority and its enforced repression and alienation. House music, for example, came, of course, from the queer black spaces that marginalized people uh, had carved out for themselves. And techno was a reaction to inner city decay as a byproduct of African-American struggle as a form of protest. So we have much work to do concerning the utilization of the emancipatory power of dance uh, and of dance music in specific revolutionary praxis, but around the world it is and has always been a central part of liberation struggles. Despite the effects of commercialization and even within the co-opted space of the club, consumerist codes can break down and borders can dissolve as dancers experience ecstatic and extraordinary states of mind which are anathema to routine alienated consumption. For a, some brief hours, dancers can realize, if only semi-consciously, that the true rewarding things in life are not money, shopping, status. After all, dancing dissolves ego identification, breaks up impediments to our flow, and temporarily restores a sense of group unity. Perhaps in some ways, the 12,000-year-old oppressive walls of hierarchical civilization can be dismantled and the structural cancer 
that is capitalism can be cured simply with joyful hip-shaking. <laughs>